Hey, thank you for dropping by for my daily devotions for Sunday, February 12th, 2023. Going to look at Romans chapter 11, Acts chapter 16, Psalm 83, Jeremiah 12. Let's pray. Father, speak to us today as we uh, look at your word, address our lives, uh, apply your word to our hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he apply, appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. And that was God's answer. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain, but the elect, but, but the elect did. The, the others were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their fullness bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though, through a, though, a, though a wild olive root, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in, granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but the kindness to you provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. But if you do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of the, an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into it, grafted into a cultivated tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. That is written, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. As for the gospel, as far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable, just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so too have so too so they too have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on all. Oh the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then Acts chapter 16.
He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewess and a believer, whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on, a, on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area that they all knew his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they, de they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem to the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew in numbers daily. That's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> That's what's supposed to happen to the church. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia and having kept having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, and concluding that God had called him to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we notice the weeds, okay? That means that the guy who wrote this, uh, Luke, the physician's with him. He's with Paul. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her house. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Once once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of, of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many for many days. Finally, Paul became troubled that so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful to us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack on Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered that they be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. They weren't very nice to him, were they? Uh, they? They weren't very nice to Jesus. They're not typically not nice to people who follow Jesus on a serious basis. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. B basically, you'd be killed if your prisoners got away in those days. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Good question, Paul answered him. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others at, the, at his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. 19 conversion accounts in the book of Acts. Every one of them, every one, ended with people being baptized, immersed into Jesus. The jailer brought them into the house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because they had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrate, magistrate sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release these men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported to the magistrates that they had 
uh, when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. It's an amazing passage. Then, Psalm 83. And one, another one of these, Psalms of Asaph. O God, do not keep silent. Do not be quiet. O God, do not be still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes fear, rear their heads. With cunning, they conspire against the people and plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. With one mind, they plot together. They form an alliance against you, the tents of Edom and, and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagrites. Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and the people of Tyre, even Assyria has joined them to lend strength to the descendants of Lot. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the river of Kishon, who perished at Endor and became like refuge on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, and who said, let us take possession of the pasture lands of God. Make them like tumbleweed, O oh my God, like chaff before the wind as fire consumes the forest or flames set the mountains ablaze. So pursue them with the tempest and terrify them with the storm. Cover their faces with shame so that men will seek your name, O oh God, O oh Lord. Um, may they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgrace. Let them know that those... That those that let them know you whose name is the Lord, that you alone are the most high over all the earth. Praying for the destruction of people who opposed God so that they would understand that God's in charge. He prayed that. Maybe we should. Okay. Then Jeremiah chapter 12. You are always righteous, O Lord. Un no, no kidding. You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would not speak of you, uh, with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the faithless live at ease? You planted them and they have not taken root and grow. They grow and, and, and uh, bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Wow. Wow. Sounds a lot like America, on their lips, but far from their hearts, lip service. Yet you know me, O Lord. You've seen me and test my thoughts. You know and drag them off like sheep to be butchered, set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals, the birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out how can you compete with horses if you stumble in safe country how will you manage in the thickets of the jordan your brothers your own family even they have betrayed you they have roused a loud cry against you do not trust them though they speak well of you i will forsake my house abandon my inheritance i will give the one i love into the hands of the enemies my inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest she roars at me, therefore I hate her. Has not my inheritance become to me like a speckled bird of prey? The other birds of prey surround and attack. Go and gather all the wild beasts, bring them to devour. Many shepherds will ruin my vineyards and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. It will make, I, it will make, it will be made a wasteland, parched and desolate before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares. Over all the barren heights in the desert, destroyers will swarm. So the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to the other. No one will be safe. They will, sh they will sow what they reap. They will sow wheat but reap thorns. They will wear themselves out but gain nothing. So... Bear the shame of your harvest because the Lord's fierce because of the Lord's fierce anger. This is what the Lord says. As for my wicked neighbor who sees the inheritance I give my people, Israel, 
I will uproot them from the lands and will uproot the house of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them back to his own inheritance and his own country. And if they learn well the ways of my people and swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, they will be established among my people. But if any nation will not listen, I will completely uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. Wow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thanks for speaking to us. Apply it to our hearts with the power and the truth of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll talk to you soon.